Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being here for the afternoon session, um, the last day of the conference. Um, I would like to welcome Ellen Goff onto stage, and she is um, assistant professor at Emory University. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Um, I want to add my voice to the chorus, um, thanking Naringen for, first of all, inviting me and also your, all your hard work in organizing the conference. It's been pretty fabulous. I've learned a lot. And I hope we'll just keep learning. Okay, so I'd like to start out my paper with some music. So let's hope this works. stop that it goes on for about eight minutes so um, you if you'd like to listen to some more you can purchase it here on this uh, website and as you can see on the website here um, this woman from Bali here this musician not just a woman a, a singer from Bali um, Divine Ma Tejo Mai Devi is chanting the 45th shloka of the Digumber version of one of the most famous recitations in all of Jainism the Bhaktamra Stotra, a Sanskrit praise poem to the first Tirtanka, Rishabha, that was probably composed sometime between the 6th and 13th centuries. This particular track was produced by Dr. Manju Jain, a counselor at the Spiritual Healing Center in Nagpur, Maharashtra, who, as we can see on this website here, um, promotes the healing effects of chanting this shloka. She claims here, it is a shloka for incurable disease. There are medical reports of scientists, doctors, testifying of the beneficial effects of these mantras and shlokas on patients. Indeed, Manju Jain has published these reports herself in a study called Jain Method of Curing, published by the International Summer School for Jain Studies. Um, it's a manual that documents 48 different ritual diagrams, yantras, incantations, mantras, and praises to people who have superhuman powers, riddhis, that when paired with a verse from the Bhaktamra Sutra are said to help cure various ailments from headaches to cancer. One of the numerous case studies contained in this book tells the story of a 14-year-old girl who was being treated for leukemia at the Central Indian Cancer Institute in Nagpur. After being told that the patient's platelet count had dropped to 4,000, Manju, Dr. Manju Jain introduced the girl to a Jain understanding of the power of sound. She says, I advised her to continuously chant the 45th shoka, a cure for incurable disease, which she followed sincerely. Her mother and her father were told to do a bishek, this ritual ablution of the yantra daily, and put this holy water on her forehead, eyes, and neck. This was followed by them sincerely in the morning and in the evenings. Within 15 days, her platelet count per cubit millimeter 
reached 37,000, and her hemoglobin increased from 3.4 grams percentage, I'm not, I don't really know what this means, hemoglobin, to 11.1 um, grams. What I do know from this account, I don't really know the science, but what I do know from the account is that just over one month later, on November 16th, 2009, the child was cancer-free. Now, skeptics, skeptics who equate the healed livers, thwarted miscarriages, and cured cancers described in Jane Method of Curing with causes other than rituals may view this monograph not only as a laughable bit of superstition, but also as a dangerous message for the millions of uneducated Indians who should be looking to modern medicine, not charms or magical diagrams, to cure deadly diseases like leukemia. Indeed, in December 2013, the government of Manju, Manju Jain's home state of Maharashtra passed what is known as the Anti-Superstition and Black Magic Act, outlawing, among other practices, the, quote, display of so-called miracles by a person and thereby earning money, and, quote, preventing a person from taking medical treatment in case of dog, snake, or scorpion bite, and instead giving him treatment like mantra tantra, gandadora, or other such things. Now, while Jain method of curing does insist that the recitation and worship of the mantra, riddhi, and yantra of verses 7 and 41 of the Bhaktamar Stotra can remove snake poison, and that worship associated with verse 10 can alleviate the effects of dog bites, Jane would likely note that she encourages patients to use Jain Mantra Shastra not in place of, but in concert with, Western medicine. Proponents of Jane's methods might also observe that clinics in the United States and elsewhere have for years used complementary practices such as acupuncture, transcendental meditation, and mindfulness yoga in matters ranging from managing addiction to palliative care. For Manju Jain, the rituals related to the Bhaktamra Stotra in her book are similar to these practices, but they're a specifically Jain way of solving problems. In terms of philosophy, however, Dr. Jain never explains how exactly these, these rituals are particularly Jain. She never explains how they work according to Jain ontology. And she's not alone in this lack of explanation. The philosophy of Jain Mantra Shastra has gone on almost completely unstudied in scholarly literature, with many people still agreeing with Andre Padu's claim from 1989 that, quote, Jain Mantra Shastra, in fact, does not differ in its essentials from the Hindu version and is not very developed. Now, many scholars have examined the corpus of Brahmanical texts that claim that Sanskrit, as the root of all languages, the mula bhasha, and the essence of the cosmos, has the power to affect change in the universe and engender liberation. A specifically Jain philosophy of sound, however, has been seen as non-existent, perhaps because Jains did not develop these sophisticated theories about the relationship between Prakrit, the language of their scriptures, the essence of the universe, and wellness and liberation. Indeed, the earliest Jain texts condemn the use of spells, vidya, and mantras, and mantras. The Shadambra Agama, the Sutra Katang, for example, declares that people who perform the spells for making someone fall down, rise, yawn for making him immovable, or cling to something for making him sick or making him well, for making someone go forth, disappear, or come, these people who perform these spells will be reborn as demons, asura, evildoers, and those who are blind, deaf, and dumb. How then, if early Jain scriptures make such claims, can modern Jains like Manju Jain justify the use of Jain mantras? What scholarship can she draw upon to explain the positive effects of chanting the Bhaktamra Stotra and related mantras? My paper today will examine one potential source for a Jain understanding of the power of sound, the Digambara Virasena's um, ninth century text called The Brightness, the Davala, a Prakrit commentary on the Digambara canonical text, the scripture of six parts, the Shatkandagama. Specifically, I'm going to look at Virasena's commentary on the auspicious invocations, the Mangalas, at the start of certain chapters of the Shatkandagama. Now, with beginnings in the early century CE, by the medieval period, it had become standard practice for authors of Sanskrit and Prakrit texts to gain the blessings of deities to, at the beginning of text, to, yeah, to bless deities um, and to gain these blessings of deities to ensure their unhindered, reader's unhindered completion of the text at hand. In a recent study of Buddhist and Brahmanical auspicious preambles of this kind, 
Christopher Minkowski has encouraged scholars to examine the cultural history of the Mangala, asking, why should we read the Mangala verses? Often we just skip over the Mangala verses, we go to the text itself, why should we read the Mangala verses? One answer to that question for students of Jainism is that early Jain Mangalas form the foundation of much of Jain Mantra Shastra, and their commentaries thus can be seen as a philosophy of Jain Mantra Shastra. Since Jains denied the authority of the Vedas, in the middle of the first millennium, when they did begin to develop an increasing number of rituals <laughs> centered around the pronunciation of mantras, they didn't develop their mantras from the Vedas, nor did they simply appropriate non-Vedic mantras of tantric cults or Buddhists. Instead, they looked to their own literature for components of text that could be used as mantras. As we'll see, mangalas were the perfect praises to become mantras used in the sort of healing rituals Manju Jain describes, because scholiasts from the first half of the first millennium had already established that to pronounce them could modify karma and thus could change the course of the future. In these commentaries, we see that for Jains, the power of sound does not come from the language of the recitation, Sanskrit's role as the essence of the cosmos, but instead comes from the virtue of the reciter and the meaning of the recitation. Okay. So before I dive into this discussion of philosophy, I'd first like to establish what this Davala, this 9th century text, has to do with the 45th shloka of the Bhaktambar Stotra that we just heard. So in Manju Jain's Jain method of curing here, each shloka of the Bhaktambar Stotra is linked to a mantra, a riddhi, a, this proper praise to a person who has achieved a superhuman power, and a ritual diagram, a yantra. So here's an example of part of a, a Bhaktamar yantra showing all of the different yantras, all 48 yantras. So these yantras on which all three of these powerful utterances are inscribed. So the mantra, the shloka, and the riddhi are inscribed on these yantras. Now Jane herself did not make up these yantras and indeed draws upon a long history dating back to at least the 13th century. And here we have an example of a Digambar manuscript of the Bhaktamar Sotra held in the British Library that dates from the 18th to 19th century. And you can see on the bottom here, here's the yantra. Well, I'm not going to use the arrow. On the bottom right here, that's the yantra to the 45th shloka that we just, we just heard. We'll dig into that in a bit. Here's another example from a 19th century, a 19th century manuscript of the Bhaktamar Sotra, again, Digambar, held in India. So some examples of the yantras um, painted on this on these manuscripts. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of examples of these manuscripts throughout India. It's the most popular manuscript you'll find in manuscript houses, both Shaitambar and Digambara, probably because of these yantras, because of these, the medicinal effects associated with these yantras that became an extremely popular text to reproduce. So let's look specifically at this shloka that we're focusing on, that we heard the 45th the yantra of the 45th shloka. So I have the two examples from the two manuscripts I just showed here. Okay, so what is going on with this yantra? So at the center of the yantra is a grid of 16 squares. You can see here. You can't see. On the right, you can see. There's 16 squares in the center. And surrounding the grid, a prakrit riddhi, or superhuman power, associated with the shloka is inscribed. So you can kind of see... Here, if you can see Om Hrim, starting there, Om Hrim Arham Namo Akina Maharna Sarnam. So Om Hrim Arham. Oh, there isn't a Narham here, but there's just Om Hrim. Om Hrim. <clears throat> right, so Om Hrim. Om Hrim prays to those with literally an ex inexhaustible kitchen, those with an unlim in unlimited supply of, of food. So then we continue there. And we work around, so we have that up at the top, and then we work clockwise around the yantra, and then the first half of the Sanskrit mantra associated. So first we have a prakrit riddhi, and then we have a Sanskrit mantra associated with the shloka moves clockwise around the square. So as you can see, starting um, up here, I don't want this to fall. I should have a pointer. So if we start right here, right there, there's om, <laughs> om namo. Okay, om namo. <laughs> Then we keep, we keep working around. It's Bhagavati, Kshudropadrava Shanti Karani. And then are we still? We're, here, we're still there. Roga Kashta 
Jwaroopashamanam Shantim Kurukuru Swaha. Okay, so that's around the edge. And then the mantra is completed in the grid of 16 squares at the center of the gut diagram. So we have this dum, 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 dum around the edge here. And then we keep going with the mantra here, Om, starting in a low clockwise round like this. Okay, so we're still doing the Sanskrit. We're still doing the Sanskrit mantra. What is that? It differs a little bit, but I'll go with the one up top on the right. So it's Om Hrim Bhagavate, if, you, if you're going around clockwise with your eyes. And it's either Bhava or Bhaya, Abhishana Haraya Namaha. So basically the full mantra reads, Ardham, often Ardham's involved. Om, praise to the Venerable One, the one who banishes misfortune, pacify and destroy fever and injurious diseases. Swaha, Om, praise to the Venerable Destroyer of, of fear. And even if we have Bhava, then even existence, Bhava. Okay, so then we have, yeah, the dum 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 surrounding that. Okay, so the mantra we can see here, um, does intuitively relate to the claimed power uh, to heal diseases. So if we look, if we look at the meaning of the shloka itself here, which talks about um, sort of even those who are bent over from the weight of terrible dropsy that has arisen. So the the shloka itself of the Bhaktamra Stotra relates to healing power, and then we have the mantra also relating to healing power. But what's a little more confusing is up top this prakrit riddhi that praises someone with an inexhaustible kitchen. It doesn't necessarily intuitively relate to the power to heal. Now, this power of having an inexhaustible kitchen is first described in detail in the Digambar text, the Triloka Pragnapti, which dates, it describes the cosmos, the Jain cosmos, and it dates from the 5th to 6th century CE. And in this text, there's an outline of 64 riddhis that the disciples, the gan Gandhar, of each of the 24 Tirthankaras are said to possess. The Tri Loka Pragnapti explains that if a mendicant with this power, this power of an inexhaustible kitchen, eats from a certain place, the food he leaves behind will remain permanently, no matter how many people are fed from it. Even if that same day an army of a Chakravartin comes to eat, not a single particle of food will be depleted. This power thus relates to health and well-being more generally, but it's still not immediately clear why praising people who have attained this power should cure a patient of cancer. When we look at the earliest recording of this praise in the Shatkhand Agama, however, and the commentary on this praise in the Davila, we can see not only why it has the power to cure cancer and other maladies, but we can also see the foundations of Jain Mantra Shastra itself. So now I want to really focus in on this proper praise here. So the praise Nomo Akina Maha Nasanam is the 42nd line of what I've called the Riddhi Mangala. And it's a Prakrit praise, it's a Prakrit list of 44 praises, mostly to ascetics who have achieved Riddhis, these superhuman powers, that opens the fourth and sixth sections, Khanda, of the Digambar canonical text on karma theory, the Shat and Agama, the scripture of six parts, which dates to the first half of the first millennium. This mangala begins by honoring the enlightened founders of Jainism, the Jinnas, and ends with praises to the Jinnah shrines and the final and 24th Jinnah, Mahavira. In between, it contains seven different groups of praises, honoring in order practitioners who have achieved powers of intellect, buddhi, powers of bodily transformation, powers allowing them to undertake extreme austerities, tapas, powers of healing, powers of physical strength, powers transform speech or food from ordinary to sweet, and finally, powers to make food and dwellings inexhaustible. So that our power belongs to this final group of superhuman powers. Um, so here I've given you a little translation of the first few praises of this mangala, and then the final, um, and then the 42nd one that we're focusing on, praise to those who can provide an inexhaustible supply of food. So this opens the fourth and sixth sections of the Shat Khandagama. And then, but these praises are not the only mangal found in the Shat Khandagam. Indeed, the first chapter of this text opens with the most famous Prakrit recitation in all of Jainism. I'm sure many of you know this <laughs> in the room. Namari Hanta Nam Nam Sadanam Nam 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 Nam
Praise to the mendicant leaders, praise to the mendicant teachers, praise to all the mendicants in this world. Now this is the earliest recording of this Pancha Namaskara, or fivefold praise to the five supreme lords of Jainism, which would eventually become the most popular Jain mantra accepted by lay and ascetic members of all Jain sects. A great deal of literature has been devoted to this mantra, which is today recited in nearly every Jain ritual and understood to be eternal and all-powerful. We heard it last night. It opened the music program last night. I'm, heard, I'm sure we'll hear it again tonight. It's extremely well known. In contrast, very little attention have be, has been paid to the Riddhi Mangala. It too, however, became one of the most important mantras of Digambar and Shaitambar ritual culture. It's recited at the outset of the most popular daily Digambar lay temple ritual, the Dev Shastra Guru Puja, and it's part of the Digambar formula of repentance, the Pratikraman, and also the formula of pacification, the Shanti Dhara. It also compri comprises the first section of the Shaitambar Suri Mantra, the mantra imparted to Shaitambar monks upon their ordinations to the highest rank of mendicancy and acharya. And we've also seen how these Prakrit praises are inscribed on the extremely popular yantras of the Bhaktamra Stotra, accepted by both image worshiping sects. So, in rejecting the teachings of the early Jain texts, such as the Sutra Kitang, that declare that Mantravadins will face a negative rebirth, medieval Jains, like their Buddhist and Hindu counterparts, accepted that mantras in destroying karma can become tools for worldly and soteriological aims. With regard to mantras destroying karma in Hindu and Buddhist settings, we can think of the tantric Buddhist Mahamudra visualization practices in which the pronunciation of certain seed syllables destroys karma, or we can think of the Shaiva and Vaishnava tantric ordinations in which the guru places his hand on the initiate's head and recites a mantra to destroy his pre the initiate's previously acquired karma. I'd also like be interested to hear what Six have to say about the mechanics of kirtan and liberation and destruction of impurities. Last night we had we had a line that said something about singing. Um, singing destroys sins. Kasmala mitjai or something. You can maybe I'd be interested in seeing how Sikhism works into this, the scheme of scheme of things. So, but for Jain philosophers at least, it's all about karma. It's all about karma. And of all the traditions, Jains may have the longest and most coherent genealogy of the relationship between the pronunciation of mantras and the destruction of karma in, yeah, in, all, of, in all of Indian traditions. So I want to talk about this commentary then on these two mangalas, this ninth century. So this is early, early century CE. These mangalas are composed, placed in Shakandagam. Then we go to the ninth century. We've got a commentary on it. Okay. What's, what's influencing this commentary? Perhaps the earliest discussion on the subcontinent of how sound can destroy karma is found in the Mulachara, a Digambar Prakrit text on mendicant conduct that's often dated to the second century CE and can be definitively placed in the first half of the first millennium. The seventh chapter of the Mulachara opens with a Prakrit benediction that has the same meaning as the Pancha Namaskara up here, though the wording differs slightly. So here we have the Mangala here, slightly. You, you can see they're doing the Namokaram Arihantanam. So after this Mangala in the Mulachara, this Digambar text, the text then contains several verses of commentary on the nature and purpose of this Mangala. This is likely the earliest discussion of how Mangalas work in all of Indian literature. In this commentary, to situate Mangalas strictly in the domain of orthodox Jain doctrine, the Mulachara specifies that reciting praises before reading texts is advantageous not because the deities or advanced practitioners invoked will then aid the devotees, but because it destroys karma. Benedictions are similarly not effective because of the link between Sanskrit and the ultimate reality, but because of the supplicant's proper disposition, it's his bhav, and devotion to the correct ideals. Commentating on this Pancha Namaskara Mangala, the text claims, for example, Whoever is intent on devotion and praises the enlightened one, the arhat, with proper sentiment, this bhav here, quickly achieves freedom from all suffering. It continues, whoever, with pure speech and pure body and mind, praises the five teachers who have the qualities discussed in previous verses, he quickly achieves liberation. And then we have a, and then we have a famous com comment here. It says, 
This fivefold praise destroys all bad karma and is the foremost mongol of all the mongolas. Now, contemporary image worshiping Shaitambaras will immediately recognize the third of these verses as it's nearly identical to the final portion of their Panchanamaskara mantra, which is first found in a much later text, the 8th to 9th century Shaitambara Agama, the Mahanasiha Sutta. So here we have the, the final portion of the Shaitambara Murti Puja um, Panchanamaskara mantra. And it's just slightly different because we have Shora Saini, so we have Havadi, for example, um, in the Mulacharya, where we have Havai, so in the Maharashtri of the Mahanasiha Sutra. And I bring this up because Jainism, part of my larger project is try to, to show the dialogue, the lasting long dialogue between Shaitambaras and Digambaras. And Jainism 101 says Shaitambaras and Digambaras have different texts. They share a couple texts. They share Tatvarta Sutra, but that's about it. But when we look at the texts that they actually read, these Vratkatas and these Pujanpats and the Stotras that describe mandalas and the mantras, Digambaras and Shaitambaras are doing the exact same thing. Re they share so many different texts. And we can see here that the, the Digambar text on mendicant con conduct and the Shaitambara Agama are both using the exact same phrase to describe this, this key mantra of both sects. But it's just not, it's not only this Mahanasiha Sutra. <coughs> oh my goodness. I knew it. I knew it would happen. Okay. <clears throat> Am I going too fast? Are we clear? We're good? We're good? Okay. I was really happy I found that line from the Mulacharya because I don't know if anyone's talked about that before, that Digambaras have that same line. But they don't accept it as part of their mangala, the Aso Panchanamokar. Okay. All right. Late. <clears throat> It's not only the Mahanasiya Sutra that was influenced by the Mulachara. Indeed, the text I keep talking about, Virasena's ninth century, the Davala, um, which will give us one way of understanding the power of praises on the Bhaktamra Sutra Yantra, also builds upon this text. So in this Davala, Virasena provides a commentary for both the Pancha Namaskara and Riddhi Mangalas of the Shat Khandagam, answering six primary questions related to a Mangala. What is a Mangala? Who is the composer of a mangala? Who is worthy of pronouncing a mangala? What is the means upaya of a mangala? What are the types of mangalas and what are the effects of mangalas? His answers to the first four of these questions are particularly instructive when thinking of the history of Jain Mantra Shastra. To provide an answer to the first question about what a mangala is, he quotes a few lines of Sanskrit. So remember, this is a Prakrit text. So he quotes a few lines of Sanskrit from an unknown text that defines a mangala as that which dissolves, destroys, slaughters, burns, kills, purifies, and crushes both mental and physical impurities, mala. This exact same claim, word for word, is made in the Triloka Pragnapti in Prakrit, so it must have been a, a popular claim. Then to give us a sense of what or who could be praised in, or whom could be praised in a mangala, Virasena further identifies mangala as jiva, or soul, and states that it contains qualities of the soul like infinite knowledge, etc. Still using Sanskrit and thus drawing upon an earlier unknown source, he emphasizes that the essence of soul, jivatva, does not exist in false views, mitya, non-cessation of bad behavior, avirati, or carelessness, pramada. So wrong believers cannot be auspicious. This argument seems to contr contradict the Jain understanding that all jivas, no matter what, contain auspicious qualities like infinite knowledge, and it's only karma that causes wrong faith. To, circum to circumvent this objection, Virasena emphasizes that one must understand jiva not as the substance, dravya, which inherently contains auspicious qualities, but as the particular modification, paryaya, the substance has undergone. Only jivas that have undergone auspicious modification should be considered mangala. So this is kind of complicated, but ultimately, the purpose of this discussion is to draw upon Jain ontology to ensure that praises to non-Jains will not be considered as effective mangalas as praising Jain leaders and ideals. Now, to answer the second and third questions, Virasena claims that a mendicant leader, an acharya, who has knowledge beyond the 14 areas of knowledge, the Veda, Dharma Shastra, Nyaya, Purana, Mimamsa, and the six Vedangas, can compose mangalas, and souls that have the ability to achieve liberation, bhavya, can pronounce or engage with them. 
He then describes the means, upaya, of the success of a mangala as whatever leads to the accomplishment of the three jewels of right faith, knowledge, and conduct. These claims show that in this Jain understanding of a power of sound, utterance's power comes not from the language in which they are composed, but from the special characteristics of their composers and reciters. Now, after answering these six questions, towards the end of the commentary on the Pancha Namaskara, Virasena engages with an imagined objector who asks whether or not the sutra or the scripture itself should be considered to be a mangala. The objector reasons, I think quite thoughtfully, that if it's not a mangala, if the sutra is not a mangala, then it should not be understood as scripture because as something inauspicious, it would cause bad karma, papa, to attach to one's soul. On the other hand, if sutra is mangala, then there's no use in the praises placed before it. There's no use in the mangala because one could, by means of the scripture alone, achieve one's goals. Virasena responds by asserting that the mangala is necessary because the scripture and the auspicious invocation destroy bad karmas in different ways. The mangala prevents obstacles in reading, while the sutra at all times destroys innumerable forms of bad karma and then eventually is the cause of the destruction of all karma. Refuting the objector's comment that the namaskara also will, will, also will destroy all karmas in the end, Virasena counters that this is not the case because without understanding the subjects of the sutras, praising Jain holy beings does not destroy karma. This makes sense because Virasena has already identified right faith, knowledge, and conduct as the instruments of the effectiveness of mangalas, and one certainly cannot abide by these three jewels without knowing the Jain scriptures. So Virasena's final refutation of the objector emphasizes that his discussion of the power of mangalas does not undermine the orthodox Jain understanding of the path to liberation. This makes sense, so, so the objector says, if the mangalas destroy karma, why don't we just recite mangalas? We don't have to fast, we don't have to do anything else. We are saying, no, 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 that's, no, that's silly, that's silly. Pure meditation, shukla gyan, is the means of liberation, he notes, and namaskaras alone, while they do destroy karma, are not pure meditation. So he puts all, all those worries to rest. So that's the commentary on the first mangala, the Panchanamaskara mangala, the most famous mantra in all of Jainism. Now later in the Davala, Virasena continues his discussion of the nature of the mangala in his commentary on this Riddhi mangala that then becomes linked with the book Tamar Stotra of the fourth chapter of the Shatkandagama. After concisely defining a mangala as that which pre destroys previously accumulated karmas, Virasena again engages with imagined objector to examine how exactly a mangala can destroy these karmas. This is kind of a good question when we're thinking about what we should recite. What we should recite and how, to, how does it work? Sometimes we take for granted that of course this mantra works. But I, I really respect Virasena for digging, digging deep here. Okay, so how exactly a mangala can destroy these karmas? So the objector notes that these praises only destroy karmas that hinder the study of scripture. If that's the case, then recitation at the time of death would be useless. Virasena responds that no rule declares that mangalas only destroy karmas that hinder the study of scripture. Thus, while Virasena does not specify when, where, and how one should recite or study the Riddhi mangala outside the context of reading the Shatkandagam, he accepts the recitation of mangalas as a legitimate way to destroy different types of karmas in a variety of contexts, including at the time of death. To show the variety of ways in which a mangala can be used, Virasena first quotes the verse from the Mulachara we saw. Um, here we go. This one. That declares that the Panchanamaskara destroys all papa. Because this verse confirms that a mangala can destroy all types of bad karma, not just a particular type of bad karma, Virasena argues, this must mean that one mangala can be used to affect all sorts of different results. How these different results are achieved, he continues, depends on the context of the recitation of the mangala. To prove this point, he quotes a Prakrit verse very similar to one found in the Triloka Prajnapti. So here's the verse. Here's the verse. So it says, at the outset of a text, there should be a mangala so that students get to the end of the text easily. There should also be one in the middle so that knowledge of the text is uninterrupted, and at the end so that the fruit of knowledge is obtained. So this verse highlights how the recitation of a mangala produces different results depending on which type of setting, action, knowledge, and devotion accompany its study or recitation. Mangalas, according to this commentary, should not simply be understood as text benedictions. They operate outside the context of text in the same way as spells, vidya, and mantras. 
To my knowledge, this commentary is the only in-depth philosophical analysis about how the riddhis of the Bhakpamra Stotra could work to heal disease. And with this sophisticated analysis of the workings of recitation, the Davila basically outlines a Jain conceptualization of the workings of mantras. One, their eff the efficacy depends on right faith, knowledge, and conduct learned from the Jain scriptures. They should be composed by learned mendicant leaders. They should be recited by souls who have the ability to achieve liberation. They are not effective if they praise wrong believers. The results differ based on context and can relate to mundane and supermundane goals. And they function in this universe because their recitation modifies different types of karma. Virasena would likely not be surprised that the praises of the Riddhimanga are being used in healing rites today. His silence on how exactly one should use these praises in ritual should not be taken for this Mangala's lack of ritual use amongst the Gumbras at that time, since Virasena was much more interested in analyzing karma theory than in outlining ritual. His mention that this Mangala can be recited at the time of death to destroy karma and presumably bring about a better rebirth suggests that it probably was used in this way during Virasena's time. Indeed, by the 10th century, just after Virasena's death, we have definitive proof in Digumbra texts that the Riddhi Mangala had been expanded by four lines in order to be inscribed in 48 lotus petals in mandalas used for meditation. So here's an example that you can't really see, but of, the, of a text of a mandala described in an early 10th century Prakrit text, the Bhava Sangraha, it's called the Brihat, Brihat Siddha Chakra. And on the outside ring, 48 praises, uh, these riddhis are inscribed. So it's the 44 praises of the Shatkandagam and then expanded by four. And my thought is they expanded it by four be, to fit the model of the mandala so that they could have 48 lotus petals to fit the model of the eight, classic eight mandala um, um, type um, with the eight, the eight lotus petals in the, in the center and then expanding outward. Actually, Virasena himself might mention um, a very popular Digumber diagram called the Ring of Disciples, in which these 48 praises are inscribed in circles in rings, and it's called the Ring, the Valaya, the Valay, of the Gandhar, because as I said before, these superhuman powers are associated with the disciples of the Tirtankaras. So this is a very popular um, mandala, Digumber yantra to this day, and Virasena might I have mentioned it here because he refers to this Ganabalaya at the end. All these superhuman powers are the Ganabalayas, which probably refers to the ring of disciples, which suggests that they, these praises were written in rings, which suggests that the, mandala, the yantra existed at this time. It's a pain because we don't have any examples of these, of these yantras and mandalas from the ninth century, but we can kind of get clues from what, what he says. So my argument is probably these, these diagrams with the 48 riddhis inscribed existed by the ninth, by the ninth century. And, this, and these 48 praises then are used, are inscribed on each of the 48 yantras of the Bhaktamra Stotra. So they're each associated with the 48 shlokas of the Digambar Bhaktamra Stotra. And this might be one of the reasons why Digambars and Shaitambars differ on how many verses are in the Bhaktamra Stotra. Shaitambars think they're 44, Digambars think they're 48, the Gumbers could think they're 48 because this is a very popular Digumber diagram and they could have required 48 verses of the popular praise to link it up with these riddhis so that they could develop these healing rituals and other, other rituals. Okay, so tons to say about that. Tons to say about that, but I should conclude. I think I'm probably out. I'm out of time. I'm just doing quick. Quick concluding remarks. To conclude my paper, I'd like to relate a story of a miraculous recovery from illness that perfectly encapsulates the Jain understandings of ritual invocations I have just analyzed. This story is found in a Shaitambar text, the seventh century Prakrit of Ashoka Churni. In this tale, a merchant, Jinadatta, wishes to marry the daughter of a man named Tana, but the daughter, Haraprabha, is beset by illness. Jinadatta confides to Dana that he knows a spell that can cure the girl, but only if someone other than celibate ascetics undertakes the spell. So uh, celibate ascetics have to take the spell. If they do not take the, undertake the spell, not only will the spell not work, but they'll die. So you've got to be a celibate ascetic to, to make this spell work. 
So Dhana thus calls four different non-Jain celibates over, and they, as instructed, stand as guardians of the directions of a mandala, and they pronounce hum fadu. But upon pronunciation, they die. Dhana, having lost faith, having lost faith, I mean, obviously, in these non-Jain ascetics, he asks some Jain renunciants to participate in the ritual. But they, as pious monks who do not take part in such spells, refuse. Thus, in place of their participation, another mandala is made, the names of these Jain monks are written on it, and, and that's worshipped. This is the trick. Hara Prabha is cured. In discussing the analysis of the Riddhi Mangala in the 9th century Davala, my paper today has examined some reasons Jains would supply for the success of Dhana's second attempt at the spell. The power of a praise, Virasena explained, does not come from the language in which the admiration is written, but instead is dependent upon proper religious belief and practice. Praising the embodiment of right faith, knowledge, and conduct, a Jain ascetic, would destroy karma and affect a variety of results. Therefore, while praising someone who has the power to always keep a fully stocked kitchen may seem like an odd thing to do to cure leukemia, this riddhi on the yantra of the 45th shloka of the Bhaktamra Stotra praises a highly advanced ascetic, indeed a disciple of a Tirthankara, and thus has great power in this world. So if we look at the instructions here on the website we began with, so the instructions Dr. Jane provided about the ideal ritual practices surrounding the chanting of the 45th shloka are justified by the Davala's commentary on Mangalas. Virasena would approve of Dr. Jane's prescription that one should chant with faith, since he's argued that the effectiveness of recitation lies in the faith of the reciter. He also would approve of the instructions to eat without salt during the 21 days of chanting, have a healthy vegetarian, vegan, etc., etc. diet, as his Davala emphasizes the importance of right conduct in the effectiveness of the Jain Mantra Shastra. Now, I totally recognize that Dr. Manju Jain, to my knowledge, has never referenced the, the Davala. And for Jain and her patients, esoteric discussions of karma theory are not as important as the transformative results of their therapy. But I, want, I wanted to present this Prakrit analysis of the Riddhi Mangala, because to push back on the idea I cited earlier that Jain Mantra Shastra is underdeveloped, I also wanted to counteract ideas such as the one Sheldon Pollock expresses when he claims that, quote, Prakrit was rarely used by Jains or anyone else for scholarly purposes after the second or third century, end quote. Though Manju Jain is likely not aware of this Davala commentary, and Jains may not have composed as many treatises on Mantra Shastra as members of other traditions, after our analysis today, it can no longer be argued that medieval Jains did not develop a uniquely Jain, sophisticated philosophy of Mantra Shastra in Prakrit. This discussion in the Davala is surely just one example of a Jain theory of Mantra Shastra in a number of yet-to-be-discovered theories that modern Jains certainly could cite when supporting the widespread use of mantras in the Jain community. OK, that's it. <clears throat> I think I went long, right? You should just come up. Sorry about that. <clears throat> oh, I got you. All right. Cool. Um, Ellen, I have a question for you. Uh, I've had a lot of questions for you. I'm going to stick to two pieces. Great. One is, um, I'm interested in, do you find um, that they, because in the Shwetamra context, Nokar Mantra is substituted all the time for other mantras. If you don't yeah. know them, you just have a certain number, you say it a certain time. Yeah. So are they doing the same thing with the Panchanamaskara? Yes. Yeah, substituting because it can because it can achieve all goals. Yeah, that's what we were saying I was trying to say. Yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. It sounded like the same thing. And then also, just do you know which karma that they're getting rid of while you... I know, he never specifies. In, you, in all of his other discussions, yeah, he never specifies. Yeah, it's very okay. curious. It's a really good question. Um, no, he doesn't specify. <laughs> but it's a good question, yeah. Because they could have karma. They have the eight different types of karma, but he doesn't it's specify. Yes, yes, absolutely. I was also wondering if Gina Sena has any discussion about the hugging of how your souls, even if the soul does everything that you are saying. Precise with with the faith and right attitude and disposition. What if it is an Abhavya soul? Is I know. Right? He suggests in the commentary, he says the requirement of number two, question number two, who can recite is Abhavya soul. Yeah. Should be Abhavya Which soul. suggests that, yeah, there are some souls, it Not just won't everyone. be affected. It won't be affected for everyone. You have to be capable of liberation. There's a certain type of soul. 